Well, this all all goes to what you've been saying that the U.S. really could be facing an existential crisis, all caused by our excessive spending and debt. The fact that we're bankrupt in so many places, the rule of law has been destroyed. Earlier, we mentioned the deteriorating military strength, all of these rise geopolitical risks. But you know, again, touching back on what I said at the top, our country, our choice. You do have hope that we can bring people together and restore America to its economic greatness and prosperity. So who is going to rise to that occasion and defend our way of life? Well, first of all, I think uh, Americans ought to get out of this business of looking for a messiah to rescue them. We're going to have to rescue ourselves. That means we're going to have to have more responsible people governing this country than the ones who are currently there in 1932. And again, in 34, FDR effectively defaulted. What he did is that he said we have to restructure our debt and told our creditors that we would pay our debt but we had to restructure the payments. The only way that we can do that, and the only way he was able to do it, well, he was able to do it for two reasons. First of all, we had an enormous amount of gold pouring into American banks from people that owed us money from the First World War. We don't have that advantage right now. The second advantage that, that he had is that he could stop spending money in certain key areas. We have to cut spending. Show me someone out there who's going to stand up and say, I'm sorry, but we simply can't afford $4.5 on an annual basis for Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. Well, nobody's going to do that. We already know that the annual payment on servicing the debt right now is roughly a trillion, a little bit short of a trillion, or equal to the cost of our defense in this country. So initially, people say, oh, well, let's go to defense. We'll cut that. Well, that's not going to get you very far. You have to tackle the $4.5 trillion. Nobody wants to do it. So I predict that we'll do what happened in Sri Lanka. We'll all go over the cliff because no one wants to cut anything. Now, once that happens, I think you'll see Washington simply stand around it with nothing to do and no one to talk to. And that's when you're going to see a kind of economic, financial, societal implosion. What happens at that point is anybody's guess. But I can tell you one thing if I were an American looking into the future, into the sort of looking glass, and I saw this coming, coming. The first thing I would say is whoever we put in charge, they can't come from within the beltway. Anybody who's there now needs to go away. So that's, that's rule number one. And rule number two is don't bring anybody in from the Ivy League schools or the service academies. Those are the people that brought us to this point that leaves plenty of Americans. But that's not something anybody inside the Beltway wants to hear. And that's not something people inside the Beltway are going to do. You know, it's really sad that there does seem to be no appetite for making long-term decisions. And we just think about the short term the next election spending our way into. You know, the next budget crisis. And a lot of people feel like they're not represented anymore. The distrust that the American public feels in Congress and politics in general is at, I think, at an all-time low. And I think you take a lot of risk sticking your neck out there, because you share thoughts that no doubt rile some of the powerful interests, and they have a history of silencing their critics. So why do you do that? Well, our country is our choice, which is why I joined. I did not find its founder and asked me to come in as CEO. The reason I did is that these people that founded it who were initial investors to help build this organization, said something that resonated strongly with me. You know, we vote Republican, we vote Democrat, we vote Republican, we vote Democrat. It doesn't make any difference. 
The outcome in Washington is the same disaster after disaster after disaster. They also concluded, and I agree with them, that there are plenty of people, Democrats and Republicans, that really adhere to what I would call traditional conservative values and view themselves as first and foremost Americans. And this is very important. Because one of the things that we've witnessed in this country is the weakening of our citizenship, the notion of citizenship, the obligations of citizenship, and that is bound up with our identity as Americans. So this is an organization that rose from, so to say, those origins and said, first of all, we want a true American first policy at home and abroad, which means we want prosperity at home and we want peace abroad. We want to withdraw our forces from all of these pointless locations. Stop getting our soldiers killed and wounded for nothing. Stop wasting money trying to transform the world into some sort of facsimile of us. Instead, let's look at the rest of the world from the standpoint of mutual respect. If we want people to respect us, we have to respect people who are different from us who govern themselves differently from us, who have a different culture from us. There's nothing wrong with them. It may not be exactly as we are. But then again, we know that we are imperfect. We've strayed quite a bit from where we began, and we have to get back on track. We can't get back on track as long as we're entangled in all these alliances overseas, and these alliances are not protecting us. They're dragging us into wars that we don't need to fight. Well, I think you're touching on something. A lot of Americans feel that we've really stuck our noses into everyone's business around the world. Everyone sees us as a bully. And going back to what we mentioned earlier, a foreign empire abroad is not compatible with a strong democracy here and a strong economy, and we've lost a lot of that. We should be an example as opposed to forcing our way upon everyone else, be that economic strength and prosperity for others to look at and want to emulate themselves and let them make that choice. Um, so as we start to wrap up, Colonel, it's just such a pleasure to have you on because you really are a voice of reason in this, in this very confusing and tumultuous time. Is there anything that you haven't been asked in all of these interviews that you do that you really think should be discussed? I think I think it might be useful at this point for everyone to understand something I like. Most Americans would like to see Israel survive. We believe Israel has a right to exist, and it should exist. We're worried that what the Israelis are doing right now is putting themselves at risk unnecessarily and that these extreme measures in Gaza are essentially forcing cohesion on multiplying enemies beyond their borders. And that's very dangerous, because as you pointed out at the beginning, we are weaker today than we were 30 years ago. We have serious problems here at home, but our armed forces are a shadow of their former selves, and we are not organized or equipped or trained, frankly, to fight differently. What we've seen in Ukraine is a paradigm shift in warfare. We haven't come to terms with it, and we're not going to come to terms with it quickly. So the right answer is, we need to withdraw to retire backward. In other words, retrench because we are not prepared right now for a major war in either Europe or the Middle East. We ought to be finding a road to peace as quickly and as expeditiously as possible because we're really not prepared to fight you. You can't make commitments to do a whole variety of things when the means to meet those commitments don't exist right now. Those means are no longer available. We have serious problems here at home. That doesn't mean abandoning Israel or anybody else, but it means impressing on them the criticality of finding a third way forward. Get out of this either, or either we win or they win, and there's nothing in between. If we can do that, then I think there's hope, but I'm not sure we can. I wish I could sit here and say these two are irreconcilable sides can find a way forward. I... I don't know. Right. Well, in the military, especially in war, 
When the stakes are highest, you have to put aside emotions. And it seems like that's the one thing that we can't do. Social media provides us with the perfect place to vent and for misinformation to spread certainly down the line with more and more AIs. It's, it's like you. You can doubt everything that you see and, and you don't know what the truth is, but, but on the emotional side, how, what is your advice for people to take that away and just make a sound decision? Because this is, this is where I think people are getting really mixed up. Well, we use the word democracy, but in reality, we are a republic. People vote for people to represent their interests. Now, we know that the people we voted into office in most cases have not represented our interests. If I were to pull, say, 5,000 Americans randomly into a stadium and ask them, do you want to go to war here? Do you want to go to war there or somewhere else? I think they would overwhelmingly say, no, we can look at the polling data over the 20th century. In virtually every case, Americans were opposed to overseas entanglements and war. So that's not really the issue. The issue is how do we get control of our government? How do we get people in Washington who represent our interests? And one of the things that you have to do if you're going to represent other people's interests is set aside your own emotion. Control it. You know, I remember sitting in a meeting with several four stars, British, German, and American, and this particular officer stood up and gave this very passionate speech about what he thought was appropriate. And the British four star said, control yourself. We're not interested in emotion. We want facts. That's what we need. We need facts, less emotion. And instead of condemning one side or the other, if we can get the facts, then there's a chance that we can find this middle road, at least temporarily. Once you get people to stop killing each other, at least for a while, things can improve. It's not a perfect outcome, but until you stop killing each other, it's hopeless.